Hello, today we'll be talking about data representation. Learning a good representation of the data is important because it can allow us to compress the data, interpret data, and even make inferences from it much more easily. To begin with, we usually have a raw representation of the data as a matrix. In this matrix, the rows correspond to the observations or the entities that we're measuring. The columns correspond to the features or the aspects of the entity that are being measured. However, this is usually not a super intuitive way of looking at the data. To give you an example, there is a pretty famous data set called the wine quality data set. It uses chemical analyses of different grapes grown for wine in different regions of Italy. Some of its features include fixed acidity, volatile acidity, citric acid, hue, and many other things. This is actually what the data set sort of looks like if you look at it from the Data Explorer on Kaggle. Of course, each column represents a different feature, but you're not necessarily seeing a connection between the columns in this representation. To give you another example, remember the single cell RNA sequencing data that I had talked about previously. Here, each observation is a cell, and each cell is basically a vector of gene measurements. And this gives the copies of mRNA for a particular gene that the cell is making. Um, the whole data is a matrix of many cells and many genes, and so each entry is a gene count for a particular cell. Data can also come as a tensor. For example, if you had many single cell RNA sequencing measurements, all measuring the same genes um, or same proteins, then you would have a data tensor, which we can talk about um, in a future um, lecture. A somewhat more intuitive representation of the data, at least for humans who are visual learners, is a spatial representation. In a spatial representation, you can take a data point, view it as a location in space. Here, you have the first feature being one, and the second feature being two, and so you can represent it as a point in R2, or two-dimensional space. Of course, if you have more than two dimensions, for example, three, you'll have to increase the dimensionality of this space. So here you have a three-dimensional representation for this point B, whose feature values are two, four, and one. And so that's its location in space. Now, thinking of data points as existing in space has a lot of uses and one of which is visualization, as I just showed you. Um, and one of the reasons this is useful is you can start to see how the data is shaped and how the data spreads. So going back to our wines data set, if you use feature one as the alcohol content, feature two as the hue, you can start to see a difference between the different cultivars. The cultivars are external labels we've imposed on these data points in this scatter point. Um, you see that cultivar 1 has a lighter hue than cultivar 0, and you see that cultivar 2 has lower alcohol level. But these aren't necessarily separate, separated uh, into distinct categories just on the basis of these features. You could have something that tells you more of a relationship between, for example, hue and alcohol. If you had a data set like this, you could infer that hue is inversely related to alcohol. If you have more features that you're visualizing or dealing with, you can start to get greater separation. So here we've added a third feature, color intensity. Now cultivar 2 is really starting to separate from the other two. It has a more intense color. And so more features and more dimensions gives you more accurate structure. But one of the problems is that as the number of features grows, you can no longer simply visualize directly the features of the data. 
So if you can only visualize in two or three dimensions, so how would you visualize point C? You could try to visualize projections that are in 2D, for example, but it might be very hard to put all of these pairs together, particularly as you start to have more and more dimensions. But given that we're visual creatures and we want to intuitively understand the data, we can try to represent the data in other ways, potentially simpler ways. What do we mean by simpler? Simpler could mean lower dimensional, as I just said. So taking a four or five dimensional data set and trying to render it into two or three dimensions, it can mean more interpretable. It can mean with more of the relevant information in and less of the irrelevant information or noise in. And these are all things that we will discuss in future lectures. So let's go with the first goal of simplification, which is to lower the dimensionality. So here you have data that's two-dimensional. If you wanted to reduce this data to a single dimension, you would have to project the data to a line. And the question is, which line should we project the data to? If you're only visualizing by feature one, and this would be the line you'd project to. But is that really the best line? So let's take a random line and see if it would be a good line we want to project the data to. So if we use this line and projected all the data to this line, it would look like this. But what you notice is that these two data points, which are the farthest from each other, are right on top of each other in this line. So this line causes you to lose a lot of the structure in the data. So potentially, it's not the best line to project to. Instead, if you project it onto this line, you would retain the distance between those two points. And you would get more of an idea of the spread of the data. So what's special about this, this line? This line actually explains most of the variance in the data. And this is a line we'll try to find using a method called principal components analysis. Now let's try to work with the second motivation for re-representing the data. And that's to make it a little bit more interpretable uh, or understandable. So let's say we have some information that we know from surveys or experiments that have happened in the past. Um, here is a survey from the Pew Research Center conducted in April 2021 that shows that um, mainly um, higher income Republicans feel they are paying more than their fair share of taxes, uh, whereas higher income Democrats don't feel that way. Here's another poll from the Gallup poll that says that High uh, Republicans um, in 2020 felt that there was about the right amount of money or too little being spent on defense. So now let's say we had information from a number of individuals on how much they're willing to pay in income tax and what percentage of the GDP should be defense spending. And it looked like this. Now from this, you couldn't necessarily tell if the person is likely to vote Republican or Democrat. But if you're a candidate in a district, you might be interested in predicting this. So you might think if there's a combination of these two features that might give you that information with higher confidence. And if you look at these lines, you might be able to tell which one. Probably this line here will tell you how likely it is that you are going to vote Republican or Democrat. So if you want higher defense spending, low income tax, people on this end probably are more likely to vote Republican and people on this end more likely to vote Democrat. So what you found here is a latent axis that explains the data and that you can make predictions from. These are the kinds of things we want to do when we learn new representations of data.